invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to Psalm 40 this morning. And uh, who's up there? Ben? Ben, I'm going to pull a fast one on you and ask you to go to slide number 31. I have a choice this morning. I can preach or I can introduce all the missionaries, but I can do that in two weeks. So I'm going to preach. Is that all right with you? I hope it is. But uh, I asked uh, Pastor Armstrong if he would uh, look up Psalm 40. I had no idea he had found it and was going to uh, be singing from it, and I really appreciate that. But you have your Bible, Psalm 40, and I want you to stand with me, and we're going to read verses 1 through 6. Now, I don't know that they can find that on the PowerPoint or not, so you're going to have to look on your Bible and follow and read with me. Psalm 41 through 6, beginning to read at verse 1, you're going to recognize the words. Let's read. I waited patiently for the Lord, and He inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it, and fear, and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. A burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Let's pray. Our Father, I thank you so much for this wonderful psalm, this uh, messianic psalm. And yet, we see the heart of David. David knew what it was to be in the mire. David knew what it was to, to be in the depths of despair. And yet, what a wonderful testimony that you lifted him up out of that place. You put him on a solid rock. He, he, you established his goings. And Lord, I know that's your desire for each one of us. Uh, there's not a one that's here today, including the one that is furthest from you, that you would not desire to take and lift up and set them on solid ground. Lord, we know that solid ground is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the redemption that we have in Christ. We thank you for the new song that you have put in our mouths. Lord, may we never be ashamed to sing of your glories. Now, Lord, bless as we have a few minutes before we observe your table together. And I pray that you would bless this time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. I don't know what the title in your Bible is regarding uh, Psalm 40. Mine says, To the Chief Musician, a Psalm of David. But I titled the message this morning, The Song of the Redeemed. I assure you, that is not the PowerPoint, but it'll be there at some point, all right? But The Song of the Redeemed. Let me tell you a little bit of, of the background with this. We don't know the occasion in which Psalm 40 was written. But if you've been following the devotionals that I have had over the, the last uh, few weeks, uh, last few months, many of them have been in the Psalms. As a result of that, you're aware that many of the Psalms came out of a time of sorrow, a, so a time of tragedy, a, a time of heartache in David's life. And so as we look at the scriptures this morning, we're looking at a man who's given a testimony that God found me. And God lifted me up. That's perfect. You, you got it, gentlemen. You're right. Just leave it there, and I'll, I'll uh, catch up with you in a moment. But Psalm 40, uh, it is, I believe, a Messianic psalm. In fact, you'll find it's quoted in Hebrews chapter 10, at least verses 5 through 9, literally taken out of Psalm 40. But I, I decided this past week to look up the titles of sermons. Now, I didn't steal my title from anyone. It's mine. But I decided to look up where other men had put an emphasis on Psalm 40. And some of them went something like, A Song in the Pits. 
I don't think Steve's song sounded like it was in the pits, do you? But that's where people go when they focus on this. Uh, another one says, a song when life has got you down. Well, the more I read of the sermon titles of other men, the more depressed I got. Because I realized they missed the whole point. The whole point of this was David's testimony that there is hope in the Lord. That God is ever there for us. He is our God. He is, is one that is desiring and longing to lift you up no matter what pit you might find yourself. On your outline, I, well, you don't have an outline in front of you, do you? So here we go. I'm going to give you, I think, four major points if I have the time this morning. Here's the first point I want to give you, and it is the claim, C-L-A-I-M, the claim of the redeemed. And let's look at it. Chapter 40, verse 1, David writes, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. Now, some people say that patience is a virtue. How many of you have trouble with patience? I'm right there with you. It is said that for those of us that use the computer, when you get that little spiral circle that goes around and around, that most Americans become frustrated after 17 seconds. And then we hit the button again to start it over again. And guess what it does? It just keeps spiraling around and around. Uh, was it Burger King that years ago said, have it your way at Burger King? Well, I want it my way and I want it now, right? I mean, fast food. You ever go through a fast food drive through and... It's not as fast as you think it ought to be. And so you're impatiently waiting for your food. Now, I have to be honest. At this point, I don't eat much fast food at all. But looking back at this, I waited patiently for the Lord. Now, I want to give you some thoughts with that, waiting patiently. Here's the first one. A praying saint knows that God answers in his time. You ever pray to the Lord and you say, I want an answer now? And the Lord says, wait. And so we wait and we wait. In fact, in my life and in your life, there are some things we have prayed for and we've waited for years. But it stirs my heart with joy when I hear a saint say, God answered prayer. Sometimes it's a prayer that goes back 10 years and 20 years and even 30 years. Another thought with that, God answers prayer, but he does so in his time. Now, notice the object of the wait. Look again at verse, 40, uh, verse 1 of chapter 40. I waited patiently. And then what does he say? For the Lord. Impatience grows out of a wrong Focus. I went to the doctor's office this week. I uh, had my eyes checked. I think it was on Tuesday. Should have gone on Monday, but I was still waiting for a miracle, right? So I go on Tuesday, and I do what you do in all doctor's offices, and that is do what? Wait. And you look at your watch, be there 15 minutes early. I'm there 15 minutes early, and they're usually 15 minutes late. So we have 30 minutes to wait. I waited on the Lord. What changed with David was his focus. And his focus was the Lord. You know how you can get a right focus? By the word. That's how you get a right focus. Is you go to the word. So David says, I waited patiently for the Lord. And then I love the next phrase. And he inclined unto me and heard my cry. Now, I will confess, as I'm getting older, I have a little bit less hearing. And sometimes some of you talk to me. You know how especially teenagers talk. My, my, my granddaughter is 12. And she'll go. Duh, 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 duh. I have no idea what she just said. So I tell her to repeat it. 
I said, do they teach you to talk like that in school? And so when she asked me a question, then I go, you know, like that. And then guess what? She gets frustrated with me. My point with this is in, David says, I waited patiently for the Lord. And then what did he do? He bent and he inclined his ear unto me. Don't be offended when you're talking to me and whispering that I have to get a little close, okay? I might have to get into your personal space to hear what you're trying to tell me. But the Lord, when he enters our personal space, we rejoice, don't we? Now notice then not only the claim, but I want you to notice the second thought on this passage is the compassion of the Lord. The Lord heard my cry. Now what did the Lord do? He responded. Look at verse uh, 2. He brought me, literally, he led me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. And he set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. The Lord brought me up out of a horrible pit. The pit was a bad place in David's life. It is a figurative expression that he's using. In the ancient times, if you wanted to capture a, a wild beast, a wolf, or you wanted to capture a bear, or you wanted to capture a lion, you would dig a pit, and then you would disguise the pit in such a way that that beast would fall into the pit. Well, you could imagine a lion that has fallen into a pit. The noise that would come out of that pit, the growling, the the roaring that would would, uh, emanate out of that pit. Now, notice this then in verse 2. The description of the word horrible is literally noisy, roaring. It is a place that that beast does not want to be. And for David, it was a place that he did not want to be. Now, I, I thought about different pits in the scripture. Remember when Joseph's brothers were thinking of, of uh, what to do with him. And the Bible says, and they put him in a pit. And they left him there. And then Midianite tradesmen came along and they brought him up out of the pit and they sold him into what would be Egyptian slavery. The prophet Jeremiah During, I think it was the king Zedekiah, the prophet Jeremiah was put into a pit. And so I I, I thought as I studied this, what are some, what are pits? Well, pits are places of sorrow. Now, Joseph didn't dig his pit, and Jeremiah didn't dig his pit, but listen, David dug his pit. He had himself in the mire of the clay. How did he do that, pastor? uh, Committing adultery with Bathsheba. And then adding to that sin, the murder of Uriah the Hittite, whom David sent to the front with the purpose that the troops would be withdrawn from the wall and Uriah would be killed. All this that David might cover his sin. But a year later, The prophet Nathan arrives and he confronts David and he reminds them of the wickedness that he had committed. And as a result of that, the miry clay would begin to be very deep. David not only was dealing with his guilt, but now he was dealing with the consequences of his sin for the baby that Bathsheba had born would die. Later, Absalom would murder his own brother. And then he would lead an insurrection against David. These are the pits in which David found himself. But let's see what the Bible says here. Notice again then, David had cried to the Lord in verse 1. In verse 2, he says, the Lord answered my prayer. And he brought me up out of a horrible, noisy pit and out of the miry clay. And then two thoughts underneath that, if you would. The one is, the Lord set my feet upon a rock. He heard me, and he rescued me. You know, God answers prayer. You do know that, right? It might be COVID in a hospital. It might be a diagnosis with cancer. Whatever it might be. It might be the heartache that a child is bringing into your life. God hears, and God answers prayer. Do we believe that? 
We better believe it. We're looking in a culture today that is a godless, anti-Christ, anti-church, anti-scripture culture. But our God hasn't changed. Because we worship and we serve an unchanging God. And so not only did the Lord bring him up out of the pit, the Lord set him upon a rock, but the Lord also established his goings. You were, the word established there is he prepared the way. You know, God's got a plan for your life, just like he has a plan for my life. When I came here in October 1985, I had no idea I'd be looking at you all this many years later. had no clue. I didn't realize you'd be that patient, to be quite honest with you. But you know, God had a plan. I look back and I know his way is what? It's perfect. His way is perfect. God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for your family. And God wants to have you walking on solid ground. Don't get caught in the mire of the world. Now, allow me to give you the third thought then. And so we, as we are looking at this, we've seen the claim of the redeemed. We've seen the compassion of the Lord. Number three, notice the carol of the delivered. Now, the word carol there is the word song or the singing of the delivered. And I want you to notice under this thought here, then two points that go with this. The first is this. Look at verse three. David's private cry was replaced with a public praise. Psalm 40 and verse 3, he has put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear, that is literally revere, and shall trust in the Lord. Now, here's the thought, and I catch myself doing this. I don't know if you do this or not. But sometimes as I move on with life, and God has delivered me from the pit, right? I start thinking about the pit. All the people that had a part helping me dig my hole, if you would, right? And if I'm not careful, I get stuck back in the pit and I lose my new song. Do you realize that God in his power and God in his love and God in his grace, he has a new song for you. One of the things in my life that changed uh, much after I came to know the Lord as Savior and as I started growing, I ended up liking different music because I had a different melody in my heart. There are things that uh, you might hear on the radio or wherever you listen that in the heart of a believer, it just doesn't resonate. It's dead. It's empty. But boy, when someone like uh, Pastor Armstrong gets up and he sings, there's a new song in my heart. I could have gotten up there and sung with him, but he didn't ask me if I wanted to do a duet, so we didn't, all right? Or, 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 or the ensemble sings, we preach Christ. Does that resonate in your heart? My, my heart's going boom, 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 boom. Now, that's not a beat. That's just a thrill, the joy. And I do sing. Uh, I sing with the choir when the choir's singing. I'm not in the choir with them, but I'm singing with them. And I'll get back sometime, all right? All right, but a new song. Now, look again, and notice the effect of the new song. I want you to notice, he had put a new song in my mouth, even praise, now there's the subject, unto our God. And then this thought, many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Here is the effect of, of Paul's testimony, or, or, or Paul, David's testimony. I told Pastor Barber, this medicine's messing with my brain. All right? But the effect of David's testimony, the effect was this. As he began to share with others that God took me out of, the, out of a pit, he set my feet on a rock, he established my goings, and I've got a new song in my heart. What was the effect of the new song? Three things. Notice it, if you would, again, in verse 3. Many shall see it. They will behold it. They will consider it. They will examine it. They will look at it. That is your testimony. If people in this world of darkness saw your testimony, if they saw your light, if they saw and heard the new song in your heart, I believe souls would be saved like we've never seen before. 
But the problem is, I think we're so tainted with the world, as a result of that, people do not see in us the dynamic change of a new song. Number two, not only will they see it, but they shall fear the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that I go, this is a pretty large Bible because I, it has a lot of notes that I have in it. But it doesn't mean that we go out into the world and we go door-to-door visitation with a family Bible, right? I mean, that'll be intimidating, but they're going to think you're a nut. But what we do take is this. We take our testimony, the new song that resonates in our heart and our soul, and we are unashamed of Christ. Thirdly, again, and they shall trust in the Lord. Could it be that the problems that we see in our nation now, and we know that we have, we have turned our back on God and we have, have roamed far from truth. Could it be that we as the church, and I'm saying in a broad sense, we've abandoned the new song. We've stopped telling others about the hope that is in Christ and in Christ alone. And as a result of that, not only do they not see it, they no longer fear and revere God. And so few trust in the Lord. And then fourthly, I told you there will only be four points. We've seen the claim of the redeemed. We've seen the compassion of the Lord. We've seen the carol of the delivered. Notice fourthly, the commendation or the praise of a blessed man. And I'm going to wrap this up quickly. But notice three things about the blessed man. Now, the word blessed is the word to be happy. It's the word joyful. It is a, a happiness that's not dependent on my circumstances. But it is a happiness that is rooted in the foundation, which is the Lord. Let's look, if you would, then at verse 4. The first one, I want you to know three traits of the blessed man. Number one, a blessed man is committed to trust the Lord. Psalm 40 and verse 4, blessed, happy is the man that maketh the Lord his trust, his confidence, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn to lies. And so where does the happy man put his trust? He doesn't put it in the world. He doesn't put it in the stock market. He doesn't put it in the politicians. He doesn't put it in Washington. He definitely doesn't uh, put it in the, the local leadership that is in a community. His trust is in the Lord. And I urge you, first of all, turn off the news. But the second thing is, Fill your heart with the good news. Make your focus and your heart and your thoughts on the word. And so the Lord's put a new song in my heart, and many will see it in verse 40, and I will trust in the Lord. Here's the second thought that goes with that. I don't have time to develop all these. But notice also, a blessed man commends the Lord to others by his witness. Notice, if you would, verse 4. Many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works, extraordinary, miraculous, which thou hast done. And then he goes on in verse 5, and he writes, And thy thoughts, thy plan, thy purpose, which are to usward, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Now, here's something for you to do today. Go home, get a piece of paper out, and start writing down God's blessings. I challenge you to do that. You're going to find in the first five minutes of trying to do that, you're going to have a hard time. But then it's like turning on, a, 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 I guess I would say, a spigot or a water hose. All of a sudden, it just starts to flow when you start thinking about all of the Lord's miracles, all of his wondrous works. I look out on the congregation here this morning. Some of you have had COVID, and it was bad. You were on your back. You were hearing things about your health that you thought you would never hear until you were my age. And you were experiencing it. And it was frightening, wasn't it? 
But do you realize that's your testimony? That is your word. To share with others what the Lord did for you. I've heard Pastor Barbara share many times about the hospital and listening to sermons and, and being, just encouraging his heart and his soul. And Sheila having COVID and in the hospital and when we were in Georgia. And, and all I could do was pray and write devotions. I was doing that. But you find yourself in the pit. You can't do anything but one thing. And what is that? Call to the Lord. I could use some of you else's illustrations, but I won't this morning. And so we have this. A blessed man is committed to trust the Lord. A blessed man commends the Lord to others by his trust. And then I'm going to finish this up this morning. Uh, verse 6. A blessed man is conscious. The Lord requires the heart. And not sacrifices alone. I'm fascinated by that. As we're looking at David's song. His psalm here. And as he's walking us through all this. All of a sudden we come to verse 6. And David says what God requires of you. Is not sacrificial offerings. In fact in verse 6. He names four offerings. Four offerings. That would not suffice. Apart from. The heart. Look at with me again. Verse 6. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened, literally hollowed out. A burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. So we ask the question as we close this morning. Then what was it that God wanted from David? And the answer is God wanted his Heart. Samuel confronts Saul. Saul had kept some that was supposed to have been slaughtered, destroyed. But instead he had chosen the best of the animals for himself. Samuel arrives on the scene and Samuel hears the bleeding of the sheep. And he looks at Saul and he says, what is that that I hear? And Saul, he's fast on his feet, as most sinners are. And he says, well, I saved the best for sacrifices. Oh, did you? And then Samuel confronts him with these words. 1 Samuel 15, verse 22. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Let me close before we transition to the Lord's Supper. The first question I have for you, is there a new song that resonates in your heart? Do you understand that what the Lord wants from you is an offering of your heart? Your all. You know, when the Lord has you in a pit, and there's no way that you can clamber your way out, and you move beyond the roaring of how unhappy you are in the pit. And then you cry out to the Lord. And he bends over and he hears. And he reaches down. He sets you up. And like a, a father with a child, he sets you on the rock. But he doesn't abandon you. You know what he does then? Then he establishes your going. What does that mean? It means he says, son, here's the way we're going to go. And you walk beside me. Remember when your children were young? Remember you steadying them on their feet and, and they had a little bit of an uncertainty. And all it took was your hand. And they were steady. They weren't afraid. They knew exactly where they were. Where were they? They were right with their father, their mother. Where were they going? It didn't matter. You see, they were with their father and their mother, and the father and the mother, well, they knew where they were going. And that's how it is with the Lord. You have a song that resonates in your heart. A song, not of music and melody, but a testimony that others see in your life your love for Christ, your commitment to his word. 
that God has a claim on your life. And know also, He commends the blessed. Is He your God? Let's pray. Heads back.